Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. Happy Friday. Happy Easter weekend. It's crazy that it's almost April. Yes, it is. Monday, April Fool's Day. It is crazy how this year has flown by and we're now basically through the first quarter of the year. That is crazy. And uh, I guess April hopefully means warmer weather, <laughs> at least for us in Omaha. It does today. I think we're going to get up 70. into the, yeah. So we're thankful for that. Yes, we are. And hopefully y'all are uh, wherever you're watching from, hopefully getting some nicer weather as well. Um, sorry that we were off uh, last week. Um, technical issues. Um, yes, go Zags, William, and thankful that they took out the chicken hawks, um, so uh, as, as we call them. And um, before we uh, get started, happy Friday, everyone, um, with our usual stuff. Um, just, uh, as if you're a baseball fan, you know that opening day was yesterday, and uh, baseball is one of those sports that can be frustrating to watch. Um, and so you pr may have seen this. Um, but Fubo added yes and MLB Network and just heard that they closed deals with four teams today uh, the Guardians, Astros, Mariners, and Rangers. Hulu Live added MLB Network, um, but YouTube TV still does not have it. And you have until Monday if you're a T Mobile customer to get uh, your free MLB.tv subscription if you're a qualifying customer. So just wanted to put that out there. It's another sign that the Seasons are changing. Got yes. Basketball is March Madness is getting near the end, and yes, the draft is coming. <laughs> yes, yes, it is. And was it the UFO, uh, the new combined league, right. is, is starting this upcoming week? Yeah, I think so. Anyway, speaking of football, the first thing that we're going to uh, discuss today is uh, you may have seen this. Uh, the NFL is all about. Uh, dominating and so as you may know the first so they're going to have their first game in brazil this season and the, so the first game of the season is going to be on thursday september 5th with the chiefs playing but the next day the next night the eagles are going to be playing uh from everything i've read it's likely going to be the cleveland browns um they are going to be playing exclusively on Peacock. Now, unless you live in the Philly market or um, the Cleveland market, assuming it's Cleveland, you if you live in one of those two markets, you'll be able to get the game on your local NBC station. Um, but everyone else, just like the playoff game that they had last year, it's exclusively on Peacock. And... Um, you know, that's understandably people were pretty frustrated about that last year. And this, I believe, is just another and a move of them trying to put their fingers in as many pies as possible to make as much money as possible. And um, also this year, this upcoming season, Amazon is going to stream an exclusive wildcard game. So only be available via Prime Video. NBC is supposedly paying $120 million for the rights to show the game, which was $10 million more than they did for the Chiefs-Dolphins wildcard game last year. And more news on the NFL is that they are going to be airing two games on Christmas Day, which Christmas Day this year is on a Wednesday. And traditionally, they have stayed away from Christmas. Traditionally, Christmas Day has been a day for the NBA to have their games and sort of be the spotlight. Well, last year, Christmas was on a Monday, and they had uh, NFL played three games, uh, all of them fairly popular, especially uh, the it was Ravens 49ers, I believe, the Monday night game, which got over 30 million viewers. So what the NFL is doing is they announced, I believe it was Monday or Tuesday, that they are going to be, through Wall Street Journal, reported that they are, the NFL is going to have two games on Christmas Day. And um, they are going to be, just read this morning on Streamable, I believe it was, that they are going to be auctioning off the rights to air those games. And create a nice little bidding war. Yes. The price up. And Streamable reported that they believe that it's going to. 
uh, likely go to a channel or a network, so like CBS or, or ESPN, what have you, instead of a streaming service. But who's to say that Amazon isn't going to step in or Peacock isn't going to step in and offer um, more? Um, and uh, I would imagine that they would want as many eyeballs as possible. So that would ostensibly mean that they would want to put it on a network instead of a streaming service behind a paywall. Um, and, and Sorry, I wanted to say real quick, I'm curious what you all think, um, if it bothers you to have NFL games on Christmas or not. And I thought this was a really interesting stat. Um, the NFL had originally back in 1971 scheduled a few games on Christmas and there was so much backlash to it that they rewrote their schedule to avoid having games on Christmas until 1989. So just kind of, yeah. they're obviously they tested the waters last season and they must it must have gone well enough that yeah. they're going to expand it this year. Yeah, and the players from what I've read aren't necessarily the most happy about it because yeah. they're going to, so if the team is playing that Christmas on Wednesday, they're now going to they're going to be playing on the previous Saturday, so it's still the same turnaround of a Sunday to a Thursday, but it just raises an injury issue. And never know, mind you, that it's during the holidays, and they've got to deal with all the mm -hmm. you know family you know uh, issues in terms of making sure family is taken care of. Um, and so, like Wood is just saying, it it's the NFL is wanting to run everything, and and they know that they are the eight hundred pound gorilla. Mm -hmm and that they're gonna get what they want. Um, That's an interesting comment, Steve. Yeah, it bothers you that it's on Wednesday more than, because it's too soon after the weekend. And uh, one of the articles we read this week said um, that Wednesday is a new thing for them, yeah. but they might even, I think they made a joke, the person in the league did about, well, Tuesday might be a bridge too far, but we'll see. So yeah. uh, maybe they'll end up having games every day. Yeah. and. Um, and to answer a question from Steve, um, yes, Amazon is supposedly going to be la landing Bally RSNs. From what I re read this week, it's not done yet because they haven't exited um, the bankruptcy proceedings, but it seems like it's very soon in the offing that, that they will have the Bally RSNs. So anyway, just interesting to watch with the NFL, and, and it'll be interesting to see who comes out as the victor to get get those um, two games. And I'm not certain if they're going to be going to want the same network or service or if they're going to be splitting them off. Knowing the NFL, they're going to do as much as they can to get as much as they can. Yeah. So. so, okay, now our next story is um, for you that who aren't sports fans and want something a little different. Um, we're going to talk about Hulu now being on Disney Plus. So if, if you have a subscription to Disney Plus and you logged in this week, you've seen this. Um, Hulu does still exist as a standalone app. And I just thought this was interesting, though. Even uh, Disney Plus changed its logo from blue to teal, which if you know, Hulu's logo is green. So it's kind of, you know, their attempt to show how they're together now. And uh, we actually are going to be doing a video on this, um, so you can watch the channel for that. But the reason I think it's, and we'll walk through what it looks like and how to find it, but beyond the mechanical stuff, the reason I think it's really interesting to talk about is that it shows where the streaming industry is going. And um, there were some really interesting articles on The Verge this week about the technology behind this move um, and all the integration that went into it. So. Um, Hulu, Hulu shows and movies and, and series and seasons and stuff will now show up in search on Disney. So it's not, yes, there's like a Hulu tile, but beyond that, it's fully integrated. It's also going to show up in the recommended content that they recommend to you. Um, and while it's not shocking, it's just Hulu inside of Disney Plus, um, so much work went on behind the scenes. So, um, from advertising platforms to metadata to personalization systems. And it's really Disney trying to move from owning a collection of streaming services and platforms to having something more like a single product across the whole company. And so, for example, the metadata, that makes search better and it improves personalization. 
And by unifying everything in the background, Disney um, is planning to use all that metadata um, to recommend things to you that you might like. And we know Netflix leads the industry in this. Um, everybody's trying to p play catch up. Um, so, you know, what you watch on Hulu is going to affect your Disney Plus recommendations and vice versa. What you watch on Disney Plus is going to influence your um, Hulu recommendations. And so we need to make sure you have your own profile so it's not right. infecting what I watch on Hulu. Yeah, that, actually that's a great <laughs> point. We watch, we watch very different things. Yes. Um, and also the article said eventually it might also influence the rides that you choose to go on when you're at a Disney park or maybe even the teams that you care about on ESPN. So. I just I thought that was that was interesting. They said it was like hundreds of thousands of titles of metadata that they had to um, get in and touch and rewrite and all of that. So it was a lot of effort, and um, I think it's it's moving towards that integration that yeah. streamers want. So yeah. we'll see. And, and as you said, Verge even reported that they might try and move. Disney might move to some one big. Mm -hmm. mega app where they have everything in, in one and that's you know who knows um, wouldn't surprise me but who knows and James uh, brings up a great question will the new sports streaming service have a DVR um, the joint venture nothing that we have seen thus far if, if they will or not it, I hope that they do mm -hmm. um, and it would make sense that they would but nothing has been reported that I that I have seen as of yet and that uh, is a good segue to our next topic is this week so Fubo as we've discussed is full out uh, assault on uh, this joint sports streaming venture um, and uh, they even uh, launched and we were going to mention this last week they have launched a service called ha an ad an, sorry not a service an ad campaign uh, with it's called hashtag save my sports so David Gandler, their CEO, is calling Fox, Disney, and Warner Brothers Discovery a streaming cartel, is what he's calling them. And he is saying that Fubo is being charged 30 to 50% more to carry sports networks from those three media companies. And thus, as a result, is forced to pass on that bloated cost to us as customers. Now, I, you know, I don't know if that's necessarily the case. It wouldn't surprise me, but I also believe on one hand that Fubo is crying over spilt milk. It's, it's sour grapes, um, I think, coming from them. So it's, I could see either side, but as Woodage uh, just noted, um, they're losing customers um, due to their pricing. Um, and he's, David Gandler said, quote, we're forced to take on content that we don't want to access must have programming, unquote. And that's just the nature of the beast with, with streaming um, and cable companies, you know, these media companies come in and say, okay, you want ESPN, for example, well, you have to carry these eight other channels, you know, for, for example. Um, and he is saying that the sports joint venture represents 80% of sports and is anti-competitive. Um, which I find that 80% number interesting given that the, um, assuming the joint sports venture comes out as has been communicated and marketed, it's only going to have 55% of available live sports. Um, and um, we, as we discussed, they filed an antitrust lawsuit against organizations in New York federal court last month over the media company's intention to launch this venture and they're calling it monopoly and um, ultimately Gandler has come out as saying he wants Fubo to become the Spotify of sports offering an automated channels of content based around user preferences and it was interesting this week um, we don't have it here but was it a New York Times or Wall Street Journal article that was equating was agreeing with Gandler and calling these three companies a sports cartel. Um, do you remember? I what? think it was the journal. It was the Wall Street I Journal. I think so. Yeah. What was agreeing. Yeah. Calling these three a streaming cartel. Now they are three 
massive companies. I don't know if you used the word cartel, but the thought. The same idea. in principle, yeah. 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 And so... <laughs> Sorry, also that CNBC video. Yeah. Uh, there's a great... It's long. It's like 25, 25 minutes, minutes. But CNBC released a really good video on this and like how the sports business is changing and streaming yeah. it's really worth it's a watch specifically espn yeah and, and they yeah. and they covered some about <clears throat> the, the market itself but it was largely about espn and uh matt thank you for that yeah uh, pack two is um as they're being called now <laughs> is uh supposedly either very close or has signed a deal for um with cw to get local games or to get their games starting next season and so going on with espn next topic and as you probably saw last week and we we were discuss it last week is that um the wall street journal came out with an article uh communicating what this what espn so not the joint venture but espn's standalone streaming app when that comes out in the fall of next year is going to be 25 to 30 dollars a month so roughly probably about half of what the joint venture is going to be. You're going to get the full ESPN experience, every live show and every live sport that they have on their platform. Um, and so they're saying that's gonna be about a third to 40% uh, of the cost of a live TV streaming service. Um, so you'll get everything in that ESPN airs on their family of networks and um, their communicating is you get this ESPN standalone app plus an over-the-air antenna, you can get pretty much all sports. Now, that's interesting because you won't necessarily get all sports because at this CNBC video uh, that Nicole mentioned, it was discussing how specifically how live sports has changed from when ESPN began and where it's at now and why it's doing what it's doing now. And when it began, it had, it dominated the market. It had over a hundred, it was in 2011, they were in over a hundred million homes. And streaming started soon after that, and they're now in 71 million homes. And so they've lost 30% of their market. And so they're trying to, I, I believe, trying it an assault and trying to reclaim and claw back some of those losses that they have incurred thanks to cord cutting. And so um, one number that they pointed out in particular was Disney. Their market capitalization was what, like two billion? Yeah. Something like that. And they were comparing them to Amazon, Apple, and Google who are all in the trillions. Yeah. And they have, I mean, Disney also has hordes of cash, but to compare a billion to trillion, they these other three companies have okay. significantly more. And we are seeing in an era where more sports are being spread out, seemingly that's a good thing because it gives consumers, the argument would be it gives consumers choice, but it doesn't because it puts too many live sports behind a paywall and so it's obviously and understandably frustrating to the viewer Mm -hmm. and um, so ESPN to go back they are trying to give fans more options and they are talking with uh, the NFL the NBA um, with college football and other and large digital players like Roku and Amazon and Apple TV to offer price points to serve as many people as possible and ESPN itself, they charge cable companies and streaming services roughly right around $10 a month. Um, and like, what was the other thing? Uh, I was just gonna say this article we're showing on screen now, if you have a subscription and you can read it, it's, it's great. And along with the CNBC video, um, it really shows how the landscape is changing and ESPN has to change uh, if they are going to survive. And one of the interesting points I thought was in that video, um, they, they were interviewing someone high up in content at ESPN and um, they brought up the point that what they're seeing with what we are seeing with streamers is they just want to, 
I shouldn't say streamers, younger people who stream. They just want to hop in when, at kickoff and when the game is over, they're done. Like there's not a lot of interest in studio shows yeah. where people are or pre-game or post-game yeah, stuff. Yeah, analyzing the game and the teams and all that. I mean, we find that interesting, but um, not everyone does. And so ESPN has built so much content around the off game stuff and they, they emphasize their ability to story tell. And I think it'll just, be curious going forward if people want that. Yeah, for sure. And so they're they're working on a deal. They're trying to talk to Roku to have some kind of exclusive access there. Um, and uh, I think they will. I think ESPN, when it yeah. launches as a standalone, it's going to have some priority placement. Yeah, yeah. Already. And um, they're they paid for. they're talking. <laughs> what, yeah, sure. they're they're talking with. Uh, different leagues to solve minority stakes and it's all going to be interesting given um, if you follow ESPN at all um, two big things ESPN bets which if you watch any ESPN sh studio show they are I think shouldn't be doing but involving betting more in it and remember and, that and, story yeah. that came out about the broadcaster yeah. who made a comment yeah, Reese Davis. Reese Davis yeah. said, "What did he say, John? He said this is He's about as sure the sure guaranteed guaranteed winning so, something just like an that. offhand yeah. comment that ended yeah. up getting some real yeah. potential hot yeah. water for making a promise yeah. about betting. Yeah, and then their their deal with Pat McAfee, which is ruffled feathers. So it's just it's going to be interesting to see what happens and and how they deal with all this and how they." Come out and Woodage, end. just seeing your comment there, I think that's a great call out. So I don't know if you want to address that, yeah. John. So ESPN, the channel itself, is the same price as ESPN Plus. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. But obviously, we get different content on yes. each thing. So yeah. that is definitely interesting. Yeah, and the CNBC video sh uh, spent some time showing how ESPN raised its cost to that ten dollar yeah. figure over time yeah and and if you have the time and if you're interested and i would highly it's it's on youtube um i highly recommend it it came out this week highly recommend it if, if you're interested so okay just shifting gears here um we're going to talk about something that's not sports related um and that would be direct tv's lawsuit against next star um that was dismissed um actually on march 20th so a little over a week ago and um it was dismissed as speculative. The judge said DirecTV could not tie any losses it suffered to the alleged antitrust conspiracy. Um, it's so, so just to like remind us a little bit, DirecTV was accusing Nexstar of price fixing those retransmission fees um, that have become a key source of revenue for local station owners. And um, in a statement, DirecTV said, quote, this ruling sets a dangerous precedent that a victim of price fixing needs to pay the inflated price before it can make a claim in court. And this, they always do this with each other, right? Yeah. But DirecTV is supposedly considering an appeal. And, um, you know, just a reminder again that this all goes back to breakdown of negotiations over those retransmission fees between DirecTV and stations owned by Mission Broadcasting and White Knight Broadcasting. And both of those groups are affiliated with Nexstar Media Group, which is the nation's largest operator of TV stations. So, and I, I guess it's just to say, unfortunately, we are the ones who pay and, you know, no matter what side you want to take, yeah. we pay with higher cost, but we also pay by, you know, these are stations that get blacked out for months sometimes, and you're still paying for them even though you don't get them. So it's, it's just something that we'll have to keep watching. I know uh, Mission Broadcasting said, quote, we look forward to resuming talks with DirecTV to restore our local television stations to the DTV platform. So, um, yeah, and then we have our another story actually yeah. is also about DirecTV. Yeah. yeah, and you may have seen seen this. We were going to discuss it last week as well, but they are now allowing subscribers to opt out of local networks to save money, um, and uh, doing so, they're saying will reduce your bill by twelve dollars a month, so one hundred and forty four a year if you were to go for the full year. And so when you sign up, 
online, you, they supposedly have an option where you can opt out of local networks to save that $12. And um, if you're a current subscriber, you can call on customer service and ask them to remove the local networks. And uh, from there, from a press release, they say any, quote, any pricing differences will be prorated based on whenever a change is initiated and appears a discount on the customer's bill by the next cycle, unquote. Um, and they are, they are saying, well, for sports fans, for example, that you could cut, them, cut your locals during the summer and then pick them back up in the fall, um, if, assuming you're a football fan or you know, whatever um, sport you're a fan of. Um, and uh, they are, um, so DirecTV's chief content officer says, quote, um, our new no locals package enables customers to take an important step forward in calling out certain types of content they may no longer care to watch and better balance the price they're willing to pay, unquote. Um, but it's only a savings of $12. And, you know, depending on where it is, you know, that really may not be a savings for you right. um, because you might be in a market where the retrans fees are 20 plus dollars a month. And so direct TV stream would still be pocketing these eight dollars, which isn't surprising at all whatsoever. Um, and it's really um, it's it represents the latest pushback from. Uh, the nation's content dis dis blah, distributors, sorry, who have grown concerned about the amount of premium video entertainment that has moved to streaming hubs, which are then sold directly by which are sold directly by companies such as Walt Disney, NBC Universal, and, and others. So, it, it's interesting to see. I think it's I think it falls a bit flat, and with Directv Stream being amongst the most expensive service mm -hmm. um i would prefer to see them offer something a little bit more cheaper um plus it's direct tv so. yeah it's an interesting way to get at it by saying that well locals aren't worth paying for because the networks are putting more and more content behind a paywall on their apps um i mean i don't know how far i would Take yeah. that. It is happening, but well, it is happening. does that mean that the local isn't worth it? Like, yeah, but then you see something like Paramount Plus, where they're and even ABC and Hulu have done bringing over original content and airing it on the linear network. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, yeah, it's interesting. So one more story here, and this is just for me. I I, I don't know if John really wanted to talk about it, but I said, let's do it. It's interesting. I want to know what you guys think. Okay, so I, full disclosure, I really enjoy, we, we both do enjoy going to the movies and always have. And I just, I love going to see something on a big screen and, you know, now the chairs are so comfy and all that. Anyway, I was saddened to see that two thirds of adults would rather just watch at home, um, which is fine, but it has me a little concerned as a movie t movie goer long term. I hope that that doesn't like kill the movie industry because I, I will always want to go to the theater. But yeah, because the fifteen to twenty dollar ticket prices won't kill them. <laughs> the well, that's that's true, and I always I don't know if the, you have this where y'all live, but we have um, there's a chain here that does uh, on Tuesdays you can go and see a movie for six bucks, any movie, any time of the day or night on Tuesday. So that's when I go because that's a lot easier to swallow than, you know, $20 for a ticket. Um, so we'll see. But yeah, this Harris poll said um, nearly half of consumers say they stream movies weekly and 30% stream at home a movie um, two or more times a week. Um, whereas that same amount, so about 30% of people surveyed said they go to the movie theater a few times a year two or three times a year so we can see i think covid accelerated it um maybe a trend that was already moving that way um they do well i don't know if they let us but maybe i shouldn't say this because we're live but there's ways especially as a woman with a big purse <laughs> So uh, to get in, smuggle in popcorn. Um, so that that's it. I'm just curious what, I just wanted to bring it up because I was curious what you all think if you um, 
if you like going to see the movie in a theater or you prefer to stream at home. Yeah, and and like Woodage says, in, um, you know, even if a even if a movie has been out for several months, it can still be full price for some people. And like my mom lives in a smaller community, and the theater it's they're not going to ha they're going to have movies longer, and still going to pay full price. And unless it's a, in my opinion, unless it's a movie that's really made to be seen on a big screen, why not wait the five or six weeks or whatever it is? and watch it on my nice TV at home. And I can pause it, use a restroom, get snacks or whatever, and I've paid $5 a month for that service. And as opposed to paying, you know, if we go as a family, that's five of us. And so we're going on a Tuesday if, if we go because that's $30 right there yeah. just, just to get in. So. Well, and AMC did this before the pandemic and I don't know if they'll bring it back but I know because my mom had it, um, for $20 a month, you could go see as many movies as you want. And like me, she loves going to see a movie in the theaters. And I feel that if they did bring that back, um, that could potentially be a reasonable, you could view that like a streaming service subscription if you really enjoy going to the movies, especially with oh. theaters releasing, I think it's become more common for them to release old movies re-release movie like you know like they're redoing twister this summer i wouldn't be surprised to see theaters um re-release the original twister just you know for five bucks yeah. or whatever if you want to go see it so five dollars <laughs> that's good five dollars <laughs> well sometimes that's what I, at least in omaha that's what some of them do i guess it's good where we live they they know there's enough frugal people here that won't pay twenty dollars to see a 30 year old movie but hey yeah. Well, thank you all for commenting there in the comments. I love, um, I love that you answered, you indulged me and humored me and answered my question. So thank you. <laughs> and I get you. If you have a really nice home theater, Steve, like, why not? Yeah. I don't have that. We don't have that. So. <laughs> well, we've got nice TVs. We do, but not like you know, with the seats that, with the heated seats and the, what I don't know why recline and the footrest and all that. I obviously I'm making the argument for the theater here. I'm not necessarily winning John over. No, <laughs> no. And to be fair, Nicole did a uh, internship for DreamWorks before we got married, so she she obviously comes at it from a slanted um, view. I do. So. I'm biased in favor of yeah. the the movie industry. Yeah. And that was a fun that was a fun job. I have to talk about that sometime, but. All right, y'all. Well, thank you for joining us. Um, we hope that you have a great weekend. Hope it's nice where you live. And um, for those of you who celebrate Easter, hopefully, you know, it's a time with your family and you get to enjoy that. And um, we will look forward to seeing you all next it's week. Friday. Yep. Yep. Bye, guys. Have a great weekend. <laughs>